Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Thursday and happy release party Thursday. I am so excited to be here with you all. This is my favorite day of the month. Always a good time. For those of you who join us every month, welcome back. For those of you who might be new here, what we do once a month is we bring the VS Code team onto our live streams to talk about some of the features from our release. So if you've been following along, the release actually went out yesterday. So hopefully you all have had some time to check that out, see what your favorite features are, and that you're pumped to see the VS Code team today. So let's see what's going on in the chat. Hey, Lavindu, happy to have you here. Coder Nerd, it is another release party. Always happy to see you here. And then David, I love when you do your guesses for the release parties. Um, so what are you guessing? Remote tunnels extension, profiles, and source control improvements. So we will see if you're correct there. I think you'll be happy with what we are showing today. Lots of excitement. Yay. I know I love these. They're my favorite part. Hello, hello, Makondu. I'm very sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly, but hopefully I did okay. Hackers, hello, hello, welcome. And Lewis, hello. Okay, love from Lebanon. Oh, thank you so much. We love having people from all over the world join these parties. It's always a good time. Um, and obviously this is December. So this is our final release party of the year. So I would love if in the chat, you all could actually drop what your favorite features were for this year. We had so many awesome ones. Um, some of my favorites, I loved Sticky Scroll. That was revolutionary to move through that. Um, let's see, what else did we have today? We, we had local history come out, the local timeline. Um, the three-way merge editor. I know that that might be controversial, but I love the three-way merge editor. So happy that we added that. Um, so let me know in the chat what your favorites are. Hello from Prague. Hello, Claudia. Thanks for joining. London, we are all over. I love this. Oh, D's Computer World. I'm so happy you love VS Code. We love you. We do this all for y'all. We are so happy to be here. Um, and speaking of doing this all for y'all, we really could not do this without y'all either. As you may know, VS Code is open source, so we rely a lot on our contributors to help us. So we like to start off these release parties with a thank you to our contributors. Okay, so this is in our release notes. We always have a thank you section at the very end of them. So that way we can do call outs. Um, and obviously there's a lot here, so I can't individually call you out, but I will do a quick scroll through. If you are watching, thank you so much for contributing. We really could not do it without you. Um, so those of you who contribute to our issue tracking, to PRs, to the VS Code repo, lots of you. I love when I just keep scrolling and scrolling because it's so fun to see how many people really make this possible. And if we scroll down, we have people to the CSS language service. Thank you so much. The ES Lint, debugging, JSON language service, GitHub, the Dafter protocol, and our dev containers contribution. So if you're watching, seriously, thank you. We could not do it without you. Um, and if you haven't yet contributed, it's a great chance to be a part of the VS Code community. So highly recommend it. All right, let's see, we've got a couple more hellos and then we'll kick things off. Hello from South Africa. Thank you for joining. Oh, we got some favorites, local history feature. Yes, I love the local history feature. That was great. Local, we have more love for local timeline. Yes, that's one of my top two. It really is so helpful um, to kind of make sure that you have that tracked. Okay, so without further ado, I know you all are here to see the amazing VS Code team. So let's go ahead and kick things off. And I'm really excited for our first guest. We have David coming on today, who is one of our designers for the VS Code team. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really pumped because I don't think we've ever had you on these release parties, or it's been a really long time at least. And I think design is such an important part to the VS Code ecosystem. So I'm very excited to see what you have to show us today. Yeah, uh, very happy to be here. Um, all right, so let's bring on your screen and we're all good. So what do you uh, have for us? Perfect. Um, well, hi everyone, uh, I'm David. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm, I'm a designer on the VS Code team and 
wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, two things. Um, one is just to give a quick kind of show and tell on some of the things, some of the UI updates we've made lately. Um, some of the things that are already in VS Code and then this latest release and uh, one or two things that are, are coming soon. Um, and then I will briefly talk about, uh, I get asked a lot about like how, how VS Code is designed and sort of what is our approach and how does it sort of look day to day. So awesome. I'm pumped. Yeah, should be fun. Yes. Um, well, I'll jump right in. Um, first thing I want to share um, is something that I've been working on lately. And I'm going to open up the theme picker here. Um, and you'll notice that I'm currently looking at the dark plus theme, which is our default dark theme. And underneath is this new entry, which looks, um, as the name might imply, uh, like a V2 version of that theme. And um, if I flip over here, you can sort of see that um, we're experimenting with new default themes for VS Code over the next couple of releases. And so this is now in VS Code Insiders, which is the version of VS Code that you can see all the sort of daily updates and try out the latest bits as we ship it. But we're, we're trying a new V2 dark theme. And you'll also notice if I go to the light theme, this is the old one. And then you can see if I switch over to the new one, um, you can see sort of the differences there. And we're really trying to kind of modernize. I'm going to switch back to dark because it's a little early in the morning. Yeah, me. I was going to say my <laughs> eyes cannot yeah, handle yeah, this a right bit now. This hour, it's still dark where I am. Um, uh, trying to modernize the look and feel of VS Code and also kind of help with things like the separation between elements and reducing the number of grays and, and accent colors and things like that. So really excited about this. Um, like I said, you can try this out at Insiders and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. We'll be iterating on this and improving it over the next couple of months before we uh, we ship it out more broadly. What's um, the best way to give feedback? Is it just to go to um, the VS Code repo? Yeah, I'd say uh, GitHub is a great way to do that. And I'll talk about that in a minute too, um, as I share kind of around like how we design stuff. Um, you know, even uh, Twitter, we're always monitoring that. Even things like Reddit, I think are great places um, uh, to get feedback. but. GitHub's kind of my favorite because we can track specific mm -hmm. issues and, and um, uh, fix them right there on the spot. Cool. Well, we have one comment from one David to this David says, looks nice. <laughs> so <laughs> That's great. As long as I've got the David's approval. The I, David's approval, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good uh, <laughs> segment covered. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, I'll move on here. I'm actually going to switch to the uh, web version of VS Code, VS Code.dev, really quickly. And I'm actually going to zoom in quite a lot here and to point out something uh, that I'm pretty happy about, which is now we've shipped rounded corners on all of our common um, inputs, so like buttons and things like that. If you look at things like our settings UI, you'll notice like the drop downs and inputs are all now using rounded corners. And you'll see this kind of other places around the product too. Um, and this is kind of another way of, of, you know, continuously sort of pushing the UI forward and trying to make it look and feel as modern as we can over time. Um, and related to that is actually we've, we've recently overhauled our custom menus. So if you're on uh, Windows or using VS Code on the web, um, you'll notice kind of these, these menus are now um, a little bit closer to what you might see in the OS and that we've changed how uh, the list selections work, like how, how we've used borders and elevation to separate it from the background. So it's all these kind of little things adding up to hopefully make uh, VS Code look and feel nicer to use. Yeah, I think that's such a good call out. Like they are little things, right? But all of it improves the user experience. So even if you can't tell exactly, you know, what maybe change you do open air, like, wow, I very much enjoy using this product. I think that's really what it's all about. Yeah. and. Um, I guess I'm, I'm noticing a trend in kind of my list here. A lot of these things are just like um, visual changes, but I think it's one of those like, yeah, many, many little things sort of add up to hopefully greater than the mm -hmm. some of their parts. But um, yeah, it's been fun to work on some of these lately. Yeah. Um, and then a couple more things, switching back over to the desktop version. Um, I'm going to open uh, what we call get started. If I zoom out briefly, you'll might, you might sort of recognize this as the uh, uh, welcome page of VS Code when you first open it. Uh, one thing we've worked on recently is to uh, really heavily update and uh, polish the built-in walkthroughs, uh, which are both used for getting started with VS Code and also uh, when you're using extensions. So 
things like these uh, theme picker thumbnails all, are all updated as well as like how you interact with these specific steps and you check them off. So we're doing a lot of work to polish this and make it feel and, and look the best it can. And the nice thing here is like if you have an extension that uses a walkthrough, which we uh, uh, always encourage um, your us your extensions users will also benefit from from all of this work. So we'll continue this work, and we're doing a lot of iterations on improving this experience. So um, for sure, more feedback. Welcome. Yeah, I love to hear that because I know a lot of times we have people in these live streams who are new to VS Code. I'm like, how do I even get started? So this is a great way just to kind of get acquainted with the editor and you know select your theme like you were saying, and just kind of figure out everything that it can do. Yeah, and uh, I guess that's worth noting, like if you ever want to get back to this, and some people ask that, like it's either easy to find in the help menu, um, that's where you can get to these walkthroughs, um, or if you're uh, so inclined, you can find it through a command, like get started, or you can even do like open walkthrough and go uh, straight to one of them. So there's a couple different ways to get back to it. Cool. And then last but not least, uh, one of the most powerful features, I think, um, in VS Code is what we call the command palette. So if I hit Shift Command or Shift Control P on uh, Windows, you get this nice UI that helps you kind of uh, lets you basically do anything in VS Code um, with your keyboard. And so I can do things like, you know, change the UI or run some actions on my code. It's really the sky's the limit. But one of the challenges we saw is that um, you know, if you're newer to VS Code or just less experienced or just haven't stumbled on it, it's hard to find that without really knowing the keyboard shortcut. And so one of the things that we've been working on is, um, I'll, I'll search for this setting. There's an opt-in setting called um, Command Center here. And if you hit this checkbox, um, you'll notice on the title bar, um, there's this nice looking input. And if I click on it, um, We've added this uh, view that basically provides like nice uh, shortcuts, if you will, to some of those um, modes. So, like I can go to file search, which previously, if I do like Command P on my Mac, um, I could get directly there. But I would have had to know that shortcut. And similarly, for running commands, um, I can kind of get there without really knowing kind of the, the fancy prefix. Like if I do the right carrot. That's right. how you get to it fast. But really, this is so how we can kind of make it more accessible for people that just uh, don't know all the fancy tricks of VS Code mm -hmm. on the first couple of days of using it. Yeah, I love the command center. It's so clutch. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, lots more to be done here. Um, you know, we did, a, I'll share a little bit about this in a minute, but there was a, a ton of iteration to get to, you know, even just what is a pretty simple list. Um, but there's there's more things I hope we can do. So let us know if there's like specific things you'd like to see here, or um, you know other challenges that you've had when you're using the command palette or searching for files. Um, all of that's really uh, welcome input. Awesome. Yeah, and we have just a couple more comments of love. It looks great already. Keep going, making it even better. Um, Tyrone said, "Yeah, little things do make a big difference." So definitely a lot of appreciation here. Um, and then just in general, sorry for that quick be right back that was showing. Um, that should be all set now. So <laughs> um, hopefully we won't have that happen again. Cool. Yeah. So David, um, is there anything else you want to show or just talk about the design process in general? Yeah. Um, if I have time, I can share briefly kind of uh, about like, you know, how what VS Code design looks like a little bit behind the scenes. Um, yeah, I think that'd be awesome. OK, great. Uh, I will switch over then to my browser. Um, and we talked about it a little bit a minute ago, but uh, I think the logical place to start is um, on the VS Code repository uh, on GitHub. And um, I think one of the things that people ask a lot is like, you know, how, how do we know what to work on? Like, where do new experiences sort of originate? And, and um, how do we iterate on them? And, GitHub and, and other places like Twitter are sort of the center of the universe in that regard. And really, I can sort of break it down like in, in two ways. Like one, uh, one source of input and in how we know what to do and, and everything is um, we have all of you in the community, um, much like we do for, for code. We have kind of feature requests and design requests happening right on GitHub. Like if I, um, I even just filter, oh, I got to sign in, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, if I just filter by UX issues, you can see there's just right now, like close to 200 things for people asking, like, you know, what if we did this or um, this is broken, things like that. So it's it's a lot like how code works. Um, on the other end, there's uh, a lot of ideas that come from within our team, you know, as as developers ourselves and people that use the product many hours a day and other developer tools. Uh, we're also, you know, looking to build the product that we think others would benefit from and that we'd want to use. So I have just like really quickly two examples, like here's a great one. You mentioned the merge editor that we just released where this was an issue that came from the community. This was back in 2017. If I scroll down and zoom in, you can see this was among the most <sighs> upvoted and popular. I think it was like the number three most upvoted issue at the time we started working on it earlier in the year. And, um, this was a perfect example of, you know, we always wanted to do this, to do this, never really, um, you know, just competing priorities. But when we did do it, that design happens in, in the open. And so I'll very often open a new issue, just like you do for, uh, you know, engineering related issues. And we'll explore the designs right here on GitHub in the open. Um, many design teams, it would be sort of like behind closed doors. You're leaving comments on Figma files and things like that. And, um, we're trying to be different in that, like all of our ideas, you can see like, you know, screen recordings of prototypes, um, tons and tons of screenshots of different examples. I mean, it really goes on. I can, I can go down um, to see many, many iterations. People will show screenshots of products that they like and they show similar experiences. And um, it's kind of one of those things where like all of this discussion is happening in this almost like town square like environment. Um, and eventually these things get built and we're able to kind of tackle like, you know, smaller issues where people are seeing like, okay, here's, here's the current experience. They kind of put little like mock-ups of their own on how they might want to improve it. And it's just that sort of iterative mm -hmm. rinse and repeat um, thing, just like we do for code. So. Um, yeah, I, I love that. So it seems like, you know, one, just for people who obviously, you know, don't see what's going on internally, the VS Code team is really great. The integration that everyone has with each other, it's a very collaborative team. Um, and you can really see that here. So it seems like the way that the code process works is really something that's informed your approach for also designing VS Code. Yeah, I think there's actually, there's, there's so much to take away from how kind of engineering teams work and the rhythm they operate on. And I think it's given us a lot of inspiration as designers to be much more sort of like, um, I guess like uh, iterative and, and not sort of having like these big reveal types of designs. It's more just like, here's my idea and then we'll really quickly course correct along the way. And and I think we're able to be quite a lot faster and end up mm -hmm. with better experiences that way. Right, yeah, I think that's so important too, to make sure, you know, that you actually have a grasp on what users want because it can be easy to be like oh they want this design and then you unveil it right if you just do this one big show and they're like whoa 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 that is not what we had pictured because <laughs> an idea of what people have is a lot of time different than what it looks like in implementation so you really do need that iteration exactly especially with something like the merge editor like mm -hmm. it's a super complex space with a lot of different ways of, of of approaching it so i think we almost need to do that or else we'd be probably way off yeah. Um, and then quickly, like, uh, you know, I mentioned this before, a, a lot of ideas uh, come from the team. Like I, I showed that command center um, when it first started, as if I pop back over, if I clicked on this, um, what we would see is just the file search. So it's like if you clicked on it and just saw this and you'd still have to kind of know how to get to the command center, like our command palette, sorry, by, by knowing like these specific prefixes, things like this. Um, and so this was an issue that we saw on our team over like, okay, this is a clear area of opportunity. And so a good number of, of issues also are coming from the team, but they still end up being iterated on the same way in, in GitHub. And it's the same thing where there's like a million, um, different explorations. Um, all of this happens in Figma, just to give you a quick peek, like we will, uh, do these prototypes that are not real code, but, uh, pretty close to the actual interaction model simple explorations to things that are farther out. Like if we had, you know, buttons in the, this was, this was an earlier exploration where it's, it's kind of like Slack if you've used that. Um, uh, it's different ways of sort of um, presenting 
the information um, in the UI. All of that will end up here on GitHub. And then, you know, I'll just scroll through down, as you can see, kind of a lot of history. That usually and oops, that usually will end up as a um, as a pull request. So this is another member of our team that, you know, made it happen, wrote the code, and this is what we ended up with today. And from there we can just open specific issues on GitHub and and um, kind of iterate on it. And you know, I'm leaving out kind of a lot. Like there's often user research studies done for larger features like the merge editor. There's we run experiments, so only a, a smaller percentage of people see things. Um, but I think this is kind of the most important thing where it's like we're designing where the code happens. And I think that's really what um, makes the approach to designing VS Code unique. So if you have ideas um, or things you'd like to see in VS Code related to the UX, um, I encourage you to open an issue or even like, you know, on Twitter, I'm there also doing the same thing where we uh, talk about like, okay, what if it, here's what it is right now. What if it looks like this? And, you know, people similarly will give me that feedback, both people on my team and people in the community um, give that similar sort of feedback in as they would in GitHub. So I, I definitely encourage you to get involved if you're passionate about a VS code and we can, uh, improve the product together. Awesome. I love that. And I think it's so interesting. Like I said, we don't usually have, you know, the design perspective on these release parties. So I think it's very interesting to hear your perspective. Um, you know, maybe we could even do like a whole breakout live stream just on design one day. Um, because I think people are really excited to see how you pick what you work on, how the whole process goes through and how, you know, obviously it seems like what you're doing on the design um, side on the VS Code team is different than how other design teams might be working. So I think it's a really interesting process. Um, cool. So yeah, is there any anything else you want to show um, or any you know anything in the roadmap you want to chat about at the end? I think that's it for me. That's everything sort of top of mind. This is a very uh, I'm leaving out so many things of like how, mm -hmm. how we work, but hopefully that's sort of an interesting peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, David, for coming on. Hopefully we will see you in some future release parties or live streams. Yeah, Have thanks so much one. for having me. Of course. All right. So let's move on to our next feature. All right. And we've got Rob coming on to talk about some Jupiter updates. Hey, Rob, Ooh. how's it going? Hey, Olivia. I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Happy to have you back on here. I know people are always pumped to see you. Great. <laughs> cool. So do we want to just dive right in? What do you have to discuss today? Yeah, let's do it. Um, basically, I was here a few months ago and I was talking mm -hmm. about, I was sort of giving a basic introduction to Jupyter Notebooks and VS Code. Um, and so if you haven't seen notebooks before, or haven't been exposed to them, um, you know, you can go back to, I think it was the 1.71 release party and check that out. Um, but today I'm going to get into um, some more of the details of, of things that we've been working on over the past couple months. Awesome. Let's see. Yeah, I love Jupyter Notebooks. I feel like I've, the past like few months, I've been playing around with them a lot more, and I feel like there's so much you can do. So I'm very excited to see this. Awesome. Thanks for trying it out. Yeah, so what I want to focus on today is uh, the kernel picker and then also uh, notebook debugging. And um, yeah, I'll just dive right into it. So. Cool. So basically, yeah, if you're not familiar with, with Jupyter Notebooks, this is basically like an interactive computing environment. Um, and it's really useful for uh, developing and presenting data science projects. Um, so the first thing you want to do when you open a notebook is you have to decide which of your Python environments you want to use to, to run your code in. Um, and so I've, I've selected it for this notebook, and it's this virtual environment that I've set up. Um, this button opens the kernel picker. And what you'll see is, is if I open the kernel picker, um, in my case, you know, it's a bit of an extreme case. I have all of these environments that I use for, for testing different things. But this, we've, we found when we watch people using notebooks that this can be a little bit overwhelming, right? So I have all of these Conda environments that I'm showing. I have these different uh, global Python interpreters that I've installed, um, other Jupyter kernels, virtual environments. And so we want to sort of help people, you know, quickly find the environment that they are interested in. Um, and so we're, we're kind of experimenting with a new format for the, the kernel picker. And I can enable that if I pull up the setting. Um, here, so uh, notebook kernel picker type. And I'll change this to MRU, which is the experiment. Um, MRU standing for most recently used. OK, cool, um, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so now if I click this, then um, instead of being quite so overwhelmed, I, 
I uh, first off the bat, I just see the environments that I've actually used in this workspace. So, you know, first I see the environment that I am actually using right now and, and some that I've used in the past. Um, and then I can also go into uh, select another kernel and I see these kind of um, sorted by, by type. And I also have the ability to connect to remote Jupyter servers, but I can see um, then my kind of full list of, of Python environments here. And so when I go into this screen, I just see that the con environments and, and virtual environments. Um, and the, you know, the, the recommended one that it knows I've used in the past is, is pulled to the top. Um, but, but mostly I just need to see kind of what's in the shorter list. And, um, and so I think that's a, a lot easier to, to really drill into, to what Python environment I, I probably want to use. Cool. Uh, so you mentioned question. the recommended one's the one that you usually use with that. Is that how it decides what the recommended is? It's going to be your most recently used one or your most often used one? Yeah, it's a combination of that and, okay. and also knowing that this is a virtual environment that's like located in this workspace folder that I have, have, have open. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, another thing that's that's really useful in here is that um, if I am just opening a workspace folder for the first time and maybe I haven't actually set up a virtual environment yet, um, or even if you like aren't a, a, a pro with setting up Python environments and, and you're not sure what you need to do to, to do that, um, you can actually create an environment through this picker now. Ooh. So if I go into my Python environments view um, and I say create Python environment, um, and I'll pick then for virtual environment and pick the interpreter I want to use. And it's actually going to create a virtual environment in this workspace folder called dot then and, and then actually get it set up for Jupyter notebooks and install IPy kernel into it. Um, and, and do everything it needs to do. Um, and so then it'll just be, be ready for me and it'll get selected for this, this notebook and then I'll just be ready to start writing Jupyter code. Oh, and nice. this, this takes about a minute. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, oh, actually that was that was fast. Okay. Nice. <laughs> I, I the internet today. It's the opposite of the demo gods. They're Conda environments. Is that, I think I saw that in the picker that you can create a conda environment right from that same menu. Yeah, Olivia, I think I, I think I lost you for a minute, but I, I heard the question. So, okay, cool. uh, so yes, uh, through that menu, you, you can also create conda environments. This as well. Okay, can you but hear me I now? Will... I think I, I blacked out again. I'm not sure what's going on on my end. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. I think we're, <laughs> I think we're good. Um, yeah, so I'll just go back to my demo demo environment um, for now then. And um, um, let's see. So that was everything I want to talk about there. Um, yeah, okay. So then, so then uh, notebook debugging uh, is the next thing. So so some people hear debugging and they think, oh gosh, that's not for me. You know, like breakpoints and call stacks and all this complicated stuff. Like I don't want right. to. I'm just gonna that. do a bunch of print statements. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's fine. That's fine. No problem with that. But mm -hmm. um, I also think uh, debugging with notebooks in VS Code is um, pretty simple and, and easy to get started with. Um, so all you have to do really is just open your notebook. Um, if you hover in the sort of left uh, column of the cell editor, then you can set a breakpoint. And if I then hit this drop down next to the run button and say debug cell, it's actually going to run my cell like normal, but it's only going to run up until the point when it gets to that breakpoint. And then it's just going to pause there and wait for me. Uh, so I'll do that. Cool. And so, um, so you can see it, it basically ran up to, up to this point and this, um, debug view opened where I can see the current values of these variables. Um, and I have these controls up here, which will let me, um, you know, control the execution of this. And um, the button that I'm interested in is just step over. And if I click this, it's just going to basically execute the next line of code. Um, and then I can click this to, to move through the notebook one line at a time. And if you watch the A variable in the locals window, you'll see, you know, you can watch the, the value of this variable change as I move through the notebook. Nice. This is so robust. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Um, and so something we've had that for for several months, but uh, something new that we just um, shipped this month is that you can um, use the restart button to restart your debug session. Oh, um, okay. So that's here. 
And this enables kind of a cool workflow that I, I like to use really often in notebooks and, and also just in, in other scripts that I'm working in too uh, when I'm debugging. But um, so you can basically be debugging and editing your code and then restarting to immediately see those changes, right? So um, for example, if I edit this string, um, I'll say this and um, maybe change this, and then I go and hit the restart button. Then it immediately reran the code, and um, so now you can see the, that those changes are, are taking place. Um, and I'll do this for this. Boom, and, and instantly in the oh, same that's thing. That's actually really uh, handy. Yeah. Yeah. So I just find this to be like a really uh, kind of useful workflow to to quickly iterate in a cell. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so so one question I had. <laughs> You're kind of showing just cell debugging in general here. I know that there's also a run by line debugging. How do those experiences differ? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, run by line is essentially sort of like a simplified debug experience that we have for notebooks. Um, so when you use run by line, you don't have to worry about breakpoints. You don't have to worry about those buttons and that complicated toolbar that I just showed you. And you won't even see this, this whole sidebar here. Um, Essentially, this button here starts a run by line session. And when I click this, it just starts running immediately um, and pausing on, on the first line of, of code. Um, okay. And then I can keep clicking this button to just advance through my code one line at a time. And as I do that, I might want to like hover variables to see their values. Um, we also have the um, variables, I think this is the button, yeah, the variables view um, that you can open in the panel. And you can also watch the values of variables um, in here as you step through with run by line. OK, cool. So this is kind of almost like a simplified. It's probably the wrong word, but you know, maybe a little more simplified here. So yeah, you don't no, have all I think, those call stacks and everything, right? OK. Yeah, exactly. I think simplified is, is exactly the right word for it. Okay, so cool. if, <laughs> if you don't want to deal with all that other stuff and you just want um, a, a kind of basic experience like this that sort of gives mm -hmm. you the essentials, um, then run by line, I think, is worth checking out. OK, awesome. We have um, someone asked what font you're using. And someone said, is it Cascadia code? Do you know oh, your I think, yeah, I think it's Cascadia code. Very good okay, eye. Cool. Yeah, someone, <laughs> good eyes, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> and we got okay, some love here. We said, can't believe all the useful things in every release. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, one oh, more right. thing to share with yeah. uh, notebook debugging. Um, mm -hmm. So we have the setting called adjust my code. And you might have seen this if you are familiar with Python debugging in general. Um, it's on by default. And if I turn it off, then this is going to allow me to step into uh, library code from Python packages that I've installed or code from like the Python standard library. Um, by default, the debugger tries to keep me just in my code. But you know, sometimes maybe you're using a library and it's like maybe it's not documented that well, or you just don't quite understand what's going on. You really just have to step into that code um, from the library and, and, and debug someone else's code. Um, so what that lets me do now that I've disabled that setting is I can put a breakpoint here and I can start debugging. Um, and so this is the pandas library where I'm creating a data frame and I can do a step in. And now I'm able to step into the pandas library and I can yeah, step through here and debug their code. If I look over at the call stack, then I can see this is the frame um, from the pandas library that I've stepped into. This is my code. I can also step back out and then keep debugging my code. And uh, yeah, that's how that works. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that that's such a useful feature, especially like you said, if you are just kind of wondering what's going on under the hood, if you know, maybe you're using a new method you're not used to, um, or anything like that, just to be like, okay, I'm getting a weird result, but I think it's doing this, right, you can actually check that way. Yeah, um, exactly. And we have some more love this feature with instant rerun. Um, so what you're showing with the restart and debugging is exactly what I've been looking for for the last few days. Um, so Frost, definitely try it out. Let us know what you think. Um, but happy to hear that. Um, and then one more theme question. Which theme are you using right now? Oh, um, this is the Dracula theme, I think. Oh, yeah. That's what I thought, because I use the Dracula theme, too, and I love the Dracula theme. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> cool. All right. Anything else you want to show, Rob, or any you know final thoughts? Um, I think that's it. But uh, I hope everyone um, checks mm -hmm. out Notebooks and lets us know what they think. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Rob. We always enjoy having you on and seeing what's the latest and greatest with Jupiter. We'll see you next cool. time. Thank you so much for having me. No problem.
All right, and then we have our last and final feature being demoed by two of our VS Code team members coming up. And first up, we were going to have Martin come on and chat about his work. Hey, Martin. Hi, Olivia. How are you doing? Very good. Uh, good. Nice Happy to, to have you on here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what will you be showing us today? Yeah, I had the pleasure to work with Connor on the new remote tunnels feature. Um, nice. We've already had a couple comments about remote tunnels. I know David at the yeah. start hypothesized this. I know someone else mentioned early on that remote tunnels is really helping them um, where they can go on holiday and still tap into the power of other machines. So I won't spoil your demo or anything. But <laughs> <Thanks very laughs> let much. us know yeah. um, no. what you have to show us. It has been an insider, uh, a few milestones now, uh, quite hidden maybe. Um, and you also have to register uh, to get access to the service, but now no more registration Registration is needed and the account is stable, but it, it's still a preview. So, uh, you know, maybe there's a bug here and there, but we are working on it. So what, remote tunnels is like uh, another um, extension to the remote development. Uh, remote development allows is like a VS Code feature that the, the window that you open is actually not uh, for stuff on your machine, but on a different machine. Right? Um, so in, what's happening is, and you see it on the, on the graph here, that the UI runs on your machine, but the, the back end of VS Code is in a different, devi different device or a container or in the cloud. And all the extensions that you have installed or the ones that have installed remotely run on the remote side, have direct access to the file system. Uh, you can run applications in there, debug. You can use the, the tools that you have installed, the whole uh, development tools and uh, tool chains are all running in there. So that's it's, it's super useful. And we have uh, there are various remote experiences. Uh, one is the remote SSH, where if you have a machine that has a SSH port open, you can connect to it and uh, work in it. We had like the GitHub code spaces is also using that technology right there. Your workspace run in the cloud hosted by GitHub. It's also used by WSL when the UI runs on Windows, but the backend runs on uh, the, the Linux distro or in the dev containers where your machine is actually a Docker container. So it's, it's nicely encapsulated, separated from your uh, machine and you can work quite securely that way. Cool. Yeah, I love the entire remote development story that VS Code has. I think it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. So what is remote tunnels? Remote tunnels is like a, a super, a, a much better SSH experience now. You don't have to uh, bring up a port anymore, but you can connect to any machine from it that is even behind proxy or cannot share any ports. So and how that, <clears throat> and that how that works, I show you here on the graphic and I, I've been a little artist with um, uh, draw I/O running in VS Code, of course, and of course it's a bit small. So don't don't worry, you don't need to read these boxes. So here on the right side, that's your machine. Martin, your um, audio is getting a little distorted. Okay. Yeah. Now I have to speak even louder. So on the right side is your machine, and what you have to do is you have to open a tunnel, and it's basically connecting to something in the cloud called the remote tunnel relay. And to do that, you have to authorize. So only, uh, only you. So, so you need a, you need a, uh, you need to go with identity, and then once that's happening, you can now connect with any machine uh, to that tunnel. Here, it's the desktop, right? And when you do you that, you have to. I can scroll on that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, and then, then you again have to provide your password. So it's it's only you who can connect to that tunnel. It's okay, not... so it's still a secure tunnel there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And here, that's what I kind of wanted to draw here, right? This is mm -hmm. uh, inside the tunnel runs another secure tunnel, and it's end to end uh, um, encrypted. So even the the relay does not see what's going going on, right? So, and then uh, that's the desktop, right? And now, super cool. And that's new is now it can also be a, a web browser, like with code spaces, right? You can have VS Code in the web. Now you can access your machine from anywhere with a browser. And yeah, and that that's it. Awesome. Cool. And now the demo will show, Connor will show you. How this. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Martin, for that overview. I think this is very interesting um, and excited to see how it looks with Connor's demo.
Thanks, Martin. Thank you. All right, and then let's bring on Connor to show what this looks like. Hey, Connor. Hello. How's it going? Hi. It's going all right. Thanks for coming uh, on. Yeah. yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, so like um, Martin said, we've been working on this for a few months, and mm -hmm. I can go ahead and uh, I'll have to tell me when you're, sharing, when you're showing my screen because I can't yep, see it on. on my end. Okay. Yep. So so we so here we have uh, VS Code Desktop. So um, I'm just working in like this small project that I have. Um, and so now, right like, now so it's wanna, showing like... the StreamYard screen. Just that's oh. why if you're trying to show something else. <laughs> uh, I think it might be. I'm going to stop and then reshare again because I okay. think that might be frozen. Cool. Yeah, I think we right. have some StreamYard technical difficulties today. All right, is that working now? Let's see. Can you see my VS Code editor? Yes. Okay, we're good. Okay. Yep. So here we have like this project, and say I want to like now go and like go work from the coffee shop or something and keep working on it. Um, so uh, the easiest way to open a tunnel, if you already have VS Code Desktop installed on the machine where you want to uh, connect to, is by going to the um, I think it's um, in the account menu here. And then the bottom option, which will be very tiny for the audience, but it's turn on remote tunnel access. And then when you click on that, um, because I've already signed in, it didn't ask me. It didn't ask me to sign in again. But now, uh, just like quickly, it turned on tunnel access and now it gave me a link that I can copy. Um, so if I go over here, I actually have an iPad emulator running right now so instead of having a real iPad. Um, so if I go in Safari, I can go ahead and paste that link. Uh, hopefully pasting works, so I have to go in something else. Uh, all right, well, I'll show you the, the other way to connect to a tunnel is by just going to vscode.dev. Um, and then once you're there, um, you'll uh, by default, you'll, show, you'll see this view, but you can go to the uh, remote view right here, and then in the drop down, choose uh, remote, and then it'll show you all the tunnels that you have running. In this case, the tunnel I have um, is called MVP for my MacBook. So if I go ahead and click on that and click the arrow, it'll go ahead and connect to my MacBook. Ooh. So it will take just a second to just to download the VS Code server itself. Cool. So uh, that's really handy if you forget your URL and you don't remember what it was or you forgot to bookmark it, whatever it could be. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then now it did that. So now I'm actually on my MacBook. So if I open a terminal, um, it'll, it'll come up here. I can like run. Um, like echo hello world and stuff. Um, and then I can also um, open the command palette um, and open a folder. And then I can browse to and like go to that folder that I was trying to show you before um, and select that. And then once you do that, then it'll go ahead and open up just like I had on my desktop. Um, and awesome. so this is cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, and so this is cool if you have like a desktop machine, but then often you also have like maybe a server or a VM or even a container that you want to be able to do the same thing to. Um, so for that reason, we also have a new VS Code CLI that's actually a standalone binary that if you go down to the bottom of our downloads page here, you'll see that we have a new CLI option. And this is actually a small a small standalone binary that can run on, on any device that doesn't have to have a desktop environment like a uh, full VS Code does. So I actually have um, a small Minecraft server that I haven't used in a while, but um, so I got a link to download the, the the CLI there, and now I'll go ahead and do that. So I download the CLI, I will unzip it. Uh, I think that's the right command. There we go, and now I have this uh, code binary that's available. So there's quite a few commands here. Um, the cool thing about the code binary is that um, if you um, is that like you, you can use it just like a desktop, like the desktop by CLI as well. So for example, if, if you try and like run like code foo.txt or something, just like you would use that as a file, um, it'll have you um, like install uh, the desktop VS code, or okay. if you have it already installed, it'll open it again. But the thing that we're interested in in this case is the tunnel subcommand. So I can go ahead and look at the help information for that. Oops, code tunnel. We'll see that there's a few commands in there. Um, in this case, I want to, uh, oh yeah. In, in this case, actually it's, it should be code panel serve, I think. Uh, hmm. 
it, it should actually have started serving that already, which is maybe a bug that we have to fix. Um, I will look at that. Um, but you should be able to run uh, code tunnel, and then that should just uh, come up and serve your Okay, I'm, oh, I'm not downloading the wrong version or something. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Oh, okay, 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 there we oh. go. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, before I was running Code Tunnel Help, which obviously shows help information. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, if you run Code Tunnel without asking it to show you the help mm -hmm. information, then it will actually work. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, um, as usual, if you, if you install the VSQ server, you'll have the to agree to the license agreement, and then we'll have you sign in to GitHub. I haven't signed in on this device before, so I'll have to do that. Wants me to copy the code in, and then I can go ahead and sign into GitHub, authorize VS Code, and then it'll go ahead and shortly start serving. Um, I think and this is how it makes it a secure tunnel is by basically giving you that yep. logging code and making you log in. Okay. Yep, exactly. Um, and then by default, it'll ask me like what I want to call this machine. I can call this Minecraft, and then it'll um, create tunnel. And then once again, it's now serving. So if I go back into onto my iPad, if I go in the remote view, go to remote, and then if I if I hit the refresh button right here, it should come up and find that tunnel. There we go. Oh, so cool. once again, so that was I can very quick to find. Yes, once you actually uh, know what command you're running, it's very quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. yep. and, and so once again, I I can go ahead and, and like hit the arrow. I'll connect to that again. Um, I, once again, I'll have to download the VS Code server, which you'll see if there's some log information on here. And once that happens, then as usual, I can go, I can open a folder and I can go to any of the uh, different folders I have on this device and run, run commands just like I would on my desktop machine. Um, awesome. So this Explorer is available by default on VS Code Dev. If you're on VS Code itself, what you want to do is install the remote tunnels extension. Okay. Um, and then that will add that functionality to VS Code Desktop, which by default, it, it isn't in there just to keep VS Code nice and slim. But this is the extension that you want. Okay. There's one question. Um, so you're kind of showing that remote menu. Um, is there a place where you can see all the places you're connected from and then close if I want to? So I'm assuming, you know, if you're maybe connected from your iPad and you don't want to be, but you're not on your iPad, can you actually remote close basically? Uh, not currently. I think that's actually a good idea. That's something that's definitely we could do. Um, but I'll make, it, I'll make a good issue for that to track that uh, as cool. a to-do item. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. That's a great um, live demo of showing how our, we take our feedback. <laughs> we love hearing <laughs> ideas. And so anytime you all have ideas, definitely let us know um, in one of these forums or just following an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also one other question. Um, does the CLI work on WSL2? Uh, yep. Um, it works on on basically any Linux device um, as well as Mac OS and Windows. So you can download the Linux version in WSL and, and run it uh, just like I did on my Minecraft server. OK, awesome. Cool. Anything else you want to show us, Connor, with remote tunnels? Um, I think that's about it. Um, it's like a, a lot of like moving parts, but the end, res the, the end experience, I think, is pretty simple, which, which was the goal. Um, and as usual, uh, this is a preview feature. So if you run into any issues or have any problems, uh, please feel free to let us know. We have a, a, um, a feedback link. We have an issue reporter. So you can go to uh, report and report issue. Um, and then also, of course, um, if you're on GitHub, you can just uh, file GitHub issues for us. And then I will personally look at your, your issue and hopefully be able to resolve it. So there you go. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> Um, I think that's really great, though, that you can even report an issue without ever having to leave VS Code. So it's just you're already in it and you can do that. You don't have to go anywhere else. I think that's a great plug. Mm -hmm. um, and Travis says, awesome. Um, I know that this is something that a lot of people find very useful. So thank you so much, Connor, for coming on and showing this off. Um, and like you said, you know, this is still in preview, but I think even preview, it's so powerful and it's going to be really exciting to see where else this goes. Yep. Thank awesome. you for having me. Well, thanks so much. I'm sure we'll have you on in future release parties. Have a good one. You too.
All right, folks, that is all that we have today for our release party. Thank you so much for the VS Code team members who came on. We really appreciate hearing from you and being able to actually see what y'all work on. Um, chat, thank you so much for participating. We love giving y'all the opportunity to interact directly with the VS Code team members. I love being able to help host these so that we can see that um, and see all the feedback we get and just see what features y'all love. Um, like I mentioned, obviously this is the last release party of the year because it's December, but one thing you all may not know is that in the month of December, the VS Code team does kind of like a housekeeping sprint. Um, so there will not be a release coming out at the start of January because, you know, obviously the holidays are coming up, a lot of people out of office. Um, so the next release will be coming out at the start of February and you will see me back here for another release party. But in the meantime, in all of January, we will have our regularly scheduled live streams. We'll just skip a month for our release parties. So thank you all for coming on. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you are currently watching this on YouTube, we have a lot of great long form videos. Um, Burke just posted a great one about the three-way merge editor. So if you're wondering what the heck merge conflicts are and how the merge editor can help you with that, that's a great video to check out. We also post shorts there and we cross post those onto our TikTok channel. So definitely make sure to also follow us there so you can just see various little shorts that we'll post throughout the week on editor tips and tricks and also just us trying to be funny. Um, like I said, thank you all for joining. Thank you for being a part of this. We couldn't do any of this without you all. Um, I hope everyone has a safe and happy new year and we will see you again in February for another release party and next week for another live stream. Thanks everyone.